Hello, everyone. Thanks for watching. I'm David Hopper, Austin Bureau Chief of 360DegreeSound.com. Over the last five years, we've been doing a series called Author Talk, in which we bring readers and viewers exclusive interviews with authors of new music-related books. A series of books that we've covered extensively is the 33 and a third series from Bloomsbury Academic. These short books focus on classic albums. Today, I'm joined by Jane Savage, an, an accomplished London-based music publicist and author of the new 33 and a third book on the 1998 album, This Is Hardcore by the band Pulp. Jane, thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Thank you for okay. me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I wonder <laughs> if you could please start by uh, telling us a little bit about your background as a music publicist and and your role in, in the rise of Britpop in the UK in the 90s. Okay, this is where I work out how to start. Um, I, I was in a band at university. I was in philosophy at university. And I was in a band called Kill Devil Hills. We were managed by a guy called Ian Dixon, who went on to be the Australian version of Simon Cowell, you know, the X Factor type mm -hmm. um, show. And um, he, he's now known as Dicko, and he lives over in Australia. But he said, let's go to London to surprise my girlfriend, who runs a, 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 a PR company over um, in London. So we went down to London um, from Nottingham, and we decided to climb through the window of her office, which was next to Creation Records, to surprise her. And she thought I was a, in a band, or well, she thought I was a pop star, actually. And when she realised I wasn't, she got quite annoyed and said, oh, can you just type this up for me? So I said, OK, and it was a press release, and I typed it up and gave it to her. And she said, how did you do that? So I just made it better. Anyway. Next day, she rang me and said she'd had a dream that she's going to work with me. And I said, OK, as long as you I'll do that, as long as you get rid of everybody in your office and I can do PR for my own band. And amazingly, she agreed. So we started doing bands like um, Gay Bikes on Acid and the Rhythm Six Sisters and Daniel Dax and PR for a label called Homestead Records uh, and Reach Out International Records, which was a cassette only label with some amazing releases on it by early Beastie Boys when they were quite a thrash band. And I suddenly got quite good at doing PR. The first thing I did was gossip for the shaman. Now, if anyone can't remember who the shaman were, they were kind of a, they were sort of they had a, a big hit about ecstasy, and they're a, they're more, maybe they're a UK phenomenon. But but to start off with, no one really knew who they were. So I was paid to get their name in the music papers, fifty pounds a week. So I used to make up stories. That's how you used to get bands' names into papers. So the perfect story about the shaman would be they were leaving Manchester in their van. And as we're driving down the motorway, the back doors of the van flew open and all their copies of their new single fell on to the, onto the motorway, so were destroyed. So if you find them in a record shop, you should snap it up because it's going to be very rare. Now, that, that's a perfect gossip story because no one gets hurt in that story at all. It's perfectly innocent. The band's name gets in the paper. And I would do this constantly with lots of other bands, just get their name into the paper. And then at this, at this point, when I was doing Gay Bikers on Acid, I realised that... Um, if you if they were put into a movement like something called the Grebo movement with Pop Elite itself and Crazy Head, they get twice as much press. And when I did a band called Green on Red, who are from Texas, and I put them in a movement called the New American Invasion with the Jason and Scorchers and the Long Riders, they get twice as much press. And I got my first cover of Maldi Maker with Green on Red, possibly they, because they were aligned to this movement called the New American Invasion. And I always remembered that. The movements were very important. So um, then I went, got a job at Virgin and did PR for people like Roy Orbison and Peter Gabriel and um, Gay Bikes and Acid followed me there, actually, from an indie band to a major label band. And I kind of didn't enjoy myself there as much as I thought I would. After two years, I realised I wanted to do bands that I found myself and liked myself rather than being given a roster by nameless people upstairs at Virgin Records. So... Me and John Best found, founded a company called Savage and Best, and we started doing bands like the Pixies and the Cocteau Twins, and then Curve and Moose and Luck and The Farm. We had lots of front covers for all the bands. And again, I noticed that if Curve and Moose and Lush were put into a movement called shoegazing, they'd get a lot more press than if they were just standalone artists, because journalists quite like to think there's something going on. That's what I was detecting at the time, in the early 90s. And then... Something else was going on this time. It, 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 I mean, I'm sorry if this is a very long story, but when I was at Virgin, I did a, I did press for a band called Animal Logic. I didn't. They were just on the roster. I didn't know who they were, and I noticed that Stuart Copeland was in the band, the drummer from the Police. And I got a, I got a phone call from America from Miles Copeland, Stuart's brother, who was managing Animal Logic, and he said, 
the band are flying over next week. Um, can you fill their day of in with interviews next Tuesday? I was 24 years old. I panicked and thought, well, I don't, who, do I, who am I going to get to interview? This? And no one knows who they are, apart from the Stuart Copeland connection. I managed to you know, m m get something together to fill the day. But I remembered that if you do a band from out, from out of town, from the States, they, were, they had a, um, a tendency to fly in and demand an itinerary, demand an interview schedule. So I thought, much easier for me as a lazy as a lazy person by nature to not have to be forced to do that. And I thought, I'm only going to do bands that live around the corner or up the road. So I was offered Smashing Pumpkins and I turned them down because I thought they might have an, an interview schedule that I didn't want to fill. So um, we, I did, so we decided to find bands that were lived around the corner, like Suede or Elastica. And then we looked after The Fall and The Juice and Mary Chain and The Charlatans and then Polk from up in Sheffield and The Verve from up in Wigan. And we found that all those bands, even though they weren't from Camden, used to hang around in our office and it was called The Camden Scene. And that developed into something called Britpop because all those bands, I mean, there are other Britpop bands naturally. You, there's two I can completely mention straight away, Oasis and Blur that Savage and Best, my company didn't look after. But um, I like to think that 62.5% of all Britpop bands were represented by Savage and Best. That's my theory anyway. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, Paul, uh, of course, one, well, in my opinion, one, one of the best of the, of the Britpop bands. I, th I think a lot, I think a lot of uh, people here in the United States, um, and perhaps casual fans uh, associate Pulp with the, with their album "Different Class" um, from, I believe, '95, and uh, that that of course uh, spawned the big hit "Common People." Uh, this is hardcore, which here's the uh, CD and the book um, is a uh, was a the follow up to um, "Different Class." It, it it was a, a less commercially successful, um, but but. You know, definitely uh, critically acclaimed. Um, I, I was the question would be, what, why would you, why did you decide to write, write, write your book on this particular pulp album? It's my favorite pulp record. It's got more depth than any other pulp record. If you look at when Different Class came out, obviously it spawned Common People, which went went to number two, and Sort of Reason Wiz, which went to number two. That was in '95. This is hardcore, didn't come out till '98. There was a, a hiatus until then. You know, that's an eon. You know, of, you know it's, it takes such a long time to, to get released. And there was many reasons for that. Obviously, Pope headlined Glastonbury in '95 by standing in for the Stone Roses. I thought it'd be far too easy to write about different class. Maybe someone else can do that. I, this record has so much depth for me. And I sort of, and when I was doing my research into it, and I, I kind of I, I worked on the record with everybody else at Savage and Best. So I knew it was a very, very deep record. So if you look at what was going on at the time, um, Pulp had um, probably been going for, um, they formed in 1978. So by the time they had some kind of success in 95, that was 17 years. When it got to the start of 96, they headlined, they they, they um, appeared at the Brit Awards where they got nominated for four awards. They didn't get any of them. And that's where Michael Jackson, this was February the 19th, 1996, as when Michael Jackson appeared on stage to perform Earth Song, surrounded by prepubescent children, shortly after he'd settled with the Jordan Chandler family after that, you know, um, at that so-called um, scandal. So when um, Jar when uh, Michael Jackson got on stage, Jarvis decided to take matters into his own hands and got on stage, and I describe it as waggled his fully closed bum at the audience, making a strange wafting gesture with his hands, um, because he thought it was kind of that Jarvis, that Jacko was trying to be some kind of messiah and, um, you know, and protector of children or whatever. So he got accused in that moment of actually knocking children off stage. That didn't happen, but he got arrested um, and, and then bailed. David Bowie's team, at the, the time, David Bowie's um, was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. So his camera crew filmed all the proceedings from the side of the stage and they showed that no children were knocked off stage by by um, Jarvis at all. So Jarvis got... Um, Set, uh, exonerated but this kind of made him so famous that he would walk down the street for instance and police would see him walking down the street and would come up to him and he thought he was going to be arrested and they just want his autograph um, so this was like a, a, a level of fame that he wasn't expecting even after 18 years he thought he wants to be famous like an astronaut not not a famous like a freak for just showing his bum on stage so that sent him spiraling into some kind of self-doubt. Um, he ran away to New York, to the Paramount Hotel, checked in under a, 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 an assumed a fake name, and um, sort of 
all this time he was coming to the conclusion that this kind of fame is very like hardcore pornography where you examine every single type of your 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 body and personality the media examine you it's very unwholesome he didn't like it and he decided to write a record about that including some very difficult artwork which is obviously a naked woman sprawled um on all fours and uh i have my own issues with the artwork um in that so it was called sexist and demeaning there were there was there was graffiti on the tube called calling it that and i had to go and defend the artwork on a radio station which i did at the time because i was defending pulp in hindsight i think actually the problem it is probably sexist and demeaning and i think the point they were making is um that that's how they felt they were probed they felt they were probed so it was my contention that this record ended Britpop accidentally because it was meant to end Hulk's career. So it's a very deep record about aging and mortality and pornography, but it's a beautiful record. Um, so one of the other um, themes I wanted to examine in the book was the nature of fame and um, why people want to be famous. And I think if you look into the background of Jarvis, you'll know that his father left the, mar the, the, the home when he was seven years old in 1970. And I sort of looked at a lot, a lot of these academic theses online about the nature of fame. And I decided to bookend the book with two conversations where Jarvis calls the Total Fame Solutions Helpline at the start of the book to say that he's, come, he's become famous for the wrong reasons and can they help him? And they put him through to the philosophy department of Total Fame Solutions and talked to him about Nietzsche and Van Gogh. Um, and then they put, put them forward to the resolutions department at the end of the, of the first chapter. And then obviously I go into the machinations of what the album's all about. And then the book ends with the Total Fame Solutions helpline calling Jarvis back to see if he's, if he's worked out anything about fame and what it means to, um, to be famous. Mm -hmm. so that's what it's about. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that, that was um, brings me to one of my... My next question, which was about yeah, Jar um, pop singer Jarvis Cocker uh, struggling with yeah anxiety and fame, and that that followed it, it after diff different class. Um, so yeah, you, you just you just give a great overview of how how that informed his uh, songwriting for for this is hardcore album. Uh, I guess um, other than the fame and por pornography you mentioned, what what do you find to be I guess the main I guess lyrical themes of the album? Okay, so um. I think it's Pop's first ever grown-up record. Um, I, if you examine the lyrics of Jarvis over time, you realise he has lots of different personalities. You never know which Jarvis you're going to get. He could be hiding in a bedroom, spying on somebody, or he's the saviour of women. He's often the saviour of women, you know, he's saving them from their horrible boyfriend or from their horrible background or something. But I think this is probably the first record where his lyrics deal with, um, with women in a very mature way. I think there's... Um, so I think the, the, the lyrics are much more grown up, and how could they not be? Because they're, as I say, they're about aging and um, and in some and mortality. The other theme, I think, during the record, I mean, obviously there's pornography and and, um, and drugs and come down is probably in several tracks on the record. But I thought, think also the to toxic masculinity that was around in the 90s. Some people say that Britpop was like that. I think Britpop might have become kind of cartoon laddie towards the end. At the start, I don't think it was. It was basically suede and pop and blur dancing around handbags in the Syndrome nightclub just off Oxford Street. And then when Oasis moved down to London with their bouncers, um, there, there was ropes around the various dance floors in some of those clubs in London. I think that changed everything because it brought football to the table, as it were. There were films like um, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. There was these, the beginning of Loaded Magazine culture and GQ and... Um, I think you know it was made, it, and there was the way it was intellectualized. Laddism was intellectualized, so that it was okay to be a new lad, for instance. Aren't you? Know, aren't they? Aren't they naughty? Those new new lads. That was kind of the way it was looked at. I think Jarvis was not a fan of that. A lot of people, a lot of people from that movement thought he was was gay, mainly because he was was clever and you know and slightly camp, I suppose, and thin, and that that to a lot of people meant that they thought he was gay, which is ridiculous. But so I think toxic masculinity is another theme on the record. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, yeah, the song uh, "This Is Hardcore," the title track is, is uh, certainly a standout. Uh, I think many people think it's one of Pulp's best songs. Uh, uh, the Steve Mackey, the, the late Pulp bassist, uh, thought it was the best song they recorded. Um, yeah. you, you, 
you you write about uh hearing it for the first time <clears> in the book and and you know being surprised it was picked as the single such a dark a dark song and 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 really unlike the, anything they'd done um so i guess what were your first impressions of the song this is hardcore and, and also i guess how do you what do you think of the song now you know over over 25 years later i think it's even better than i thought it was then and i thought and I, I think it's probably my favorite pop song of all time and it's one of the few songs that's even better once you've seen the video most of the videos detract from the song's worth, I think, but there's a few Beastie Boys sabotage things to mind, which are just, which make the song even better. And I think it's a film in itself, you know, and it's, um, it's uh, you know, like a 19, 1950s melodrama. It's a, it's a movie in, in sort of six or seven minutes. And when I first heard it, when Jeff and Jeanette first played it to me in the Rough Trade Offices, I remember listening to it and going, thinking, wow, and then saying, so that's the singing, is it? Immediately realizing that there would there would be a, quite a job to get, you know, to get. Uh, well, not necessarily make our job because pulp were loved by the media. All the bands we did were loved by the media, and the public came second because we we all the bands we represented were all press bands. They were lyric, bands obsessed with lyrics, and because the media liked to write about lyrics, that's why we got so much press. So I knew that knew that this is hardcore. We'll get an enormous amount of press if you look at it. I mean, maybe 40, 45 magazine articles came out at the time about that album. And so, you know, several covers, maybe 12 or 13 covers came out to coincide with the record. So I knew the press would be easy enough. But I thought because of the record seemed to be about drugs and pornography, that it's the nature of the press and it would be difficult because people will be, you know, examining what on earth Pope had been up to. I mean, the very first cover was death, porn, heroin, what's eating Jarvis Cocker. That was the first headline on the cover of Select magazine. And, you know, they explicitly asked me, have the band been taking heroin? And, you know, so, so, how are you meant to answer a question like that? You know, it's, it's ludicrous. So yeah. I don't think I answered it, and therefore they just wrote what they wanted anyway. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, the song uh, Help the Aged was also... Um... I'd say an unusual single, uh, in that you know there's not not many pop songs about caring for the elderly. Uh, you, you write in the book that it's easily the most heartfelt song on the album. Um, I believe Jarvis Cocker was only 33 when when he wrote the song. Uh, what, what do you think it was that that prompted him to write a song about about aging and mortality at, at his age? I think um, they've been they hope toward different class. Uh, so much. I mean, for the six months after um, Different Class came out, up until the Brit Awards, and then they went on tour again after the Brit Awards, they were in a tour bus, sleeping in bunks, which are like coffins. If you've ever seen what a tour bus is like, you know, you climb up on it, it's, it's the length of you, basically, unless you've got a really snazzy one. And um, I think, you know, part of that, being in a confined space, and also being examined all the time by the media, you get to look at photographs of yourself, you see yourself aging in front of your own eyes as you're looking through an eyeglass at all the photographs. If you've done 50 magazine articles and someone's telling you to look at the, these photographs of you every day when you look different, and you might have had a drink or a cigarette or something, I think that makes you very aware of your own mortality. So I think um, all those things were going on in, in um, Jarvis's head at the time, as much as he realised that um, everybody ages. And the thing about the pop star dream is you're not meant to age. You meant to deny the possibility of aging, but we all age. And I think it was Jarvis realizing he was the same age as, age as Jesus, for instance, on the song Dishes, when Jesus died, they were the same age as Jarvis was then. They've got the same initials, JC. And um, that you know, that and then there's also there's also, if you look back, uh, there is kind of this thing that's in the ether, which if you haven't achieved anything by the age of 33, by the time Jesus died, what have you achieved? So all these things were going through. I think Jarvis said when he wrote the record and particularly helped the aged. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you mentioned it earlier um, about the cover art. Uh, it, it was uh, controversial in the UK. Uh, as you said, you know, posters of, of it were graffitied in, in London. Um, mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little more about that controversy and, and, uh, and the band's intent with the imagery. Okay. So I think the intent was to show a sh shocking image to show what pornography does to to people um 
So it's a pornographic image almost. You don't see anything from the um, lower torso down, but you see uh, a woman, a nameless woman sprawling on all fours. Um, obviously, so she looks as if she might have just been assaulted, for instance, or collapsed for some reason, post-coital, you know. So I think um, when uh, when This Is Hardcore is written across her, her, her cheeks, it looks like it's stamped, like she's owned. I had a problem with that. Um, I also had a problem with the fact that it was meant to be a painting, really. They got John Curran, the artists involved, but it was digitally manipulated using this special technique. So in the end, it ends up looking like a photograph. It's hyper real. So it's half photograph, half um, painting. I think because of that, it also makes it look very demeaning. We don't know anything about the model that's used on the cover. Her name's Ksenia, um, and she's from Belarus. Uh, that's what I've discovered. She was 17 at the time, I think. She modeled for FHM. We don't know anything about her. So I make the comparison to Lolita that we don't know anything about Lolita. Um, we just see, we just get the narrator's view of Lolita. And, you know, they're both quite controversial pieces of work. Obviously, Lolita's kicked up more of a stink than, than the artwork for a pulp record. But we're constantly reassessing the way we look at pieces of work like that. And I think in today's culture, it's even more difficult to look at that record and, and realize that it's, that it's his, his difficult record, <clears throat> sleeve artwork to think about positively, even though I think it's beautiful and I know what they're doing. But I think I came down in the end to say a snuff movie about a snuff movie is still a snuff movie. So you can put something in someone's face and just say, well, I'm just showing you what it is. I don't know, that's kind of disingenuous to some degree, isn't it? It has a... Uh... Jarvis Cocker been asked about it like years later. I was wondering if he if he got on the record, but about it. Well, like, occasionally I think, I, think it, it, I mean, I, I must have read 150 articles, maybe more, about this record, and came across some of the ones that Jarvis had done in more recent years. Probably maybe five years ago, he commented about it, and he he said it's they're beautiful, not, they're not grotesque the images. But I think he was talking about John Curran's work generally. Um, and I'm so I think that it's the digital manipulation that takes it from painting to photograph that that makes it an issue. If it had been a painting, it's slightly different to assess the work. I think so that he came down on it. They're beautiful. They're not grotesque. And I would say they're probably beautiful and grotesque. To be mm -hmm. honest, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you you of course you know, use a lot of uh, quotes from Jarvis Cocker and, and other band members. Um, you know, from various uh, magazine articles and press coverage over, over the years. And, and of course, you know, you had a uh, represented Paul, uh, they were your client as, as a publicist, but I, I was wondering, did you um, uh, try to interview Jarvis uh, particularly for this book? I specifically didn't. For my, it came out two years ago, here they come with their makeup on about Suede. I spoke to all the bands and I spoke to Brett at length, I spoke to the producer, Ed Buller, and to the label boss Saul Gulpin and to Neil and Richard and um, various other people associated with the record, even though I was incredibly close to Suede and I could have written the book without speaking to them, I wanted to speak to them. For this book, it's 33,000 words, believe it or not. Did you know that about the 33 and the third books? They're all 33,000 words. It's oh, not a 75,000 word opus. I wanted my opinion um, in this book. I want it to be something so that the band couldn't really object because um, I, if I spoke to them, they'd probably want copy approval. And I knew that um, I wanted this book to be just my opinion of this record. I think that's what the 33 and a third book should be, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I know that Jarvis has read it and he likes it and I'm happy with that. Okay, great. Uh, I guess uh, the question would be if if you were to um, ask uh, Jarvis Cocker today, you know, w w one question about the This Is Hardcore album, what, what would you ask him and why? Okay, now you really put me on the spot there, David. Yeah. You, uh, I mean, well, I'll just say, what what did you hope to achieve, and did you achieve it? And that's kind of um, that's kind of all I I try and answer that question in the book when the Total Fame Solutions Helpline called Jarvis at the end of the book. What do you think about fame? Have you achieved what you wanted to do with this? I think he said in in the sleeve notes of the reissue that came out maybe five years later um, that uh, it was uh, it was. The best book. It was the. It was a very successful um, sort of uh, 
album about failure, something like something like that. So it was the most successful sound of failure or something. So I think um, I think he probably achieved what he would. I mean, it's difficult to know if they'd done different class part, part two, whether they would have been catapulted to this giant, you know, arena arena band worldwide. And that was it was it was kind of um, I mean, the record was so difficult that obviously it put a full it put a stop on, onto some of their um, you know activities because they didn't go to the next level. But I think artistically, it took them to a, a new level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, uh, and finally, um, what why do you think this album marked the end of the Britpop era? Why do I think that? Because, mm -hmm. uh, well, I think there were several contenders. I think Suede probably tried to do it with Dogman Star as far back as '94, because that's a really sexual record and dark record. Um, and then Radiohead did tried to do that as well. And I think Blur did it with with um, with uh, with their sort of American sounding record. Um, but I, and then Oasis obviously had an album with, uh, with not one song less than half minutes long on it. But I think this record, because Pulp were an upbeat band who was, you know, with a kind of sense of humour, I think it was such a dark record, which nobody expected. I think, well, I thought if they're doing a record like that, it's probably the end of everything. It's the end of everything. That's what mm -hmm. it was really. Great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for watching uh, Jane Savage's book on Pulp's this is hardcore 33 and a third edition is, is uh, for sale now. And uh, I guess wherever books are sold and, and, and uh, available are available uh, online. So on the Bloomsbury website, uh, thank you so much, Jane, for speaking with us. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.